Here you go, Mammoth. I want to do it. You want to do it? Let's see if I can get this off here. Let's see if she'll say something about the pig. Tell them to feed the pig. Say, feed the pig. Feed the pig. Feed the pig. Feed the pig. There you go. Feed the pig. All right, we've been having yard sale, hon, and we had that yesterday. If you assisted on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, either stand up or raise your hand. All right, if you just put something in the yard sale, let's do the same. Let's do, do the same thing. All right, if you prayed for the yard sale, raise your hand. If you bought something, raise your hand. All right, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. We wake, woke up on, I guess, you're scared. You don't have to be scared. It's just people. All right. Now, we woke up on Sunday morning. We live out on Union City Road, for those that don't know, and it's pouring rain. I thought, oh, no. I don't know if y'all got any rain or not. And I thought, it's going to be that way. I looked at the map, and it said that it was going to rain from, like, 8 to 9 o'clock. We never saw a shower come in. Me and Kurt, we looked and said, you know, it was going to rain from 8 to 9. It just kind of disappeared. It was an absolutely beautiful day. We had hundreds of people in this parking lot, hundreds of people that showed up. And Miss Judy, she made an absolute feast, and I want to give you some totals that we got. Judy, from her bake sale and, and her hard work alone, got $154. Now, the yard sale, and we still have some money outstanding, I understand, brought in $1,059.85. So that was a grand total of $1,213.85 of that we got for Operation Christmas Child and the youth. And, you know, this was God working at his best. We had people coming in here. We would invite them to church, and they would say they weren't good enough to come to church. That's what we're dealing with, people that don't think they are qualified to walk through these doors, not realizing we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. So that's what's going on. We need to do more of these outreach programs, but there was hundreds of people. And if we do this on an annual basis or once more, uh, you know, if you all could just put in the same same type of effort, I really appreciate it. Thank y'all. I don't know about you, but I think we just heard our sermon. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> Real quick, let me go over a couple of things. First off, just welcome everybody. We're excited to have you here to worship with us and and uh, have the truth of the word proclaimed by Dave. He's here uh, joining us again. Uh, remember the ladies on Tuesday, uh, they meet, uh, and that is the what we call the homeless project, basically homeless, um, also the uh, nursing home. They, they do a lot of things. They're just trying to be an outreach to help people uh, in, in every situation that they can, and they're doing a marvelous work. One more time I'm going to say, some of you younger ladies or somebody who knows some younger ladies would be a great opportunity for you all to bring them and mentor with these ladies because these are the ladies, as I call the seasoned ladies, and they have a lot of wisdom to give. I think you really would enjoy uh, being part of that but then also giving to that. So I think it, just see if that grows. Remember Wednesday night, of course, food's at 6.15. You bring your own food. Uh, they eat and at 7 o'clock is a Bible study. So uh, you have that on Wednesday as well. Uh, one more time, I'm going to announce this because uh, I think it's just so important. The night of life, uh, Amy said that people have reached out to her for her. She has tickets, can get you tickets. It is free. Uh, anyway, this is right over here at Eastern's uh, Center for the Arts, and it's a night of life. And, if, you know, for you and I that, that uh, I don't want to get political. I'm just saying it's a shame that we even have to have this, but that's another story. But anyway, the girl that's going to be speaking was basically for Planned Parenthood. And we know that with uh, abortions being done and, and a, the uproar now just because of some stuff that's happening with some laws, uh, it's kind of crazy. And, and uh, I, I just pray that, that the good Lord just forgives us. But anyway, uh, this is going to be something that if you want to enjoy that, uh, get, reach out to Amy. She is going to be, uh, has the tickets for these, but this is over at Eastern. And remember, the baby bottles are here. The baby bottles, we put our extra change in, uh, and that actually goes towards the Pregnancy Help Center. 
to help these girls uh, in their decision to keep their babies uh, and, and raise uh, them to, to life instead of destroy their lives by killing them. All right, things coming up real quick. These ladies it put the puts to shame with everything that they're doing. So, guys, June 4th, there's a sign-up sheet. June 4th, it is at 5 o'clock. It is a men's barbecue. We're going to have a cornhole tournament. Uh, dinner uh, and, a, and a guest speaker so please sign up for that let us come together uh, and I know it's extra effort for us guys those guys kind of are ones that stand back and, and don't uh, kind of come together but we need to guys and I'll make my best effort to do that as well but anyway June 4th we're, we're going to have that June 12th uh, during Sunday school a uh, Heather Sloan from the Richmond Active Living Center will be uh, presenting the services available through the Active Living Center uh, and this will be a great information for everyone to have, uh, for family members uh, and in yourself as well, as we all kind of grow in age. And that will be held here in the sanctuary. All right, so you're kind of up to date with everything. We may be small in number, but we are mighty because we believe in the Lord. And right now we are search searching for a minister, and the prayer prompt comes from day 24. I've used this one before, but I think it's really important that we look at it again. Pray for the minister who is able to rightly divide the word of God. It is important that what's being taught here is straight truth from God's word. So we need somebody that can rightly divide that word of God. And then pray for our search committee because we have some sermons that we listen to to try to understand their approach, their, their thoughts, and, and the way they are with their congregations. So help the, pray for the search committee to listen to sermons of potential minister candidates and, and be, uh, have God's wisdom upon us as we look at that. So the scripture comes to this, and it's 2 Timothy uh, 2, 15, uh, 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of of truth. So we are commanded to know the word of truth and to deliver that word of truth rightly. And that's what we stand on, as, which is God's word. So I'm going to ask you, though, to stand. We're going to get started this morning. This song is a Chris Tomlin song. It is forever. It says, Give to the Lord a God and King. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord.
Father, we come to praise you, to worship you. And God, even though we are in the midst of ourselves sometimes, God, I ask for forgiveness. Lead us now this time, and Lord, the words that are spoken, the songs that are sung, the things that are done. Lord, I pray that they give you glory and honor. Forgive us again. Walk with us, God. We thank you for everything that's being done this last week, this last day, this last month. Lord, I pray for those that are suffering, that need you, that don't think they are good enough to be here. As you have sent your son, that they can walk in here and know him. So thank you, Lord, for that. Forgive us again. Lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This old song, I've talked about it several times. I love this song. This is a song that my dad used to just love to hear, and I love to sing it. Try not to do it too often, but I want to hear it, and then I picked it out for this day. It is As a Deer Panteth. people said amen. amen you know one thing that was presented to me to to just tell you all there were coming at our time of prayer there were two people specifically that asked the people that was here to please pray for them and one of the prayer her name's pat hunter she prayed that uh, i guess she's having some trouble with her feet and she has prayed that they won't have to remove her toe and then we have Hunter and Danielle Treeman. They work with the campus outreach, and they are taking a group of college students to Panama City in June. You know, there's Phil, there's Dave, there's many people that, that uh, you know, everybody in here has a family member. And we watched what Dennis has went through just lately. Um, and then Alicia and then other folks that have people who are sick, sons and daughters who are sick. And, and this is a time that we pray, and I know I keep talking about it at times, but these are the times that we pray as a congregation united. We pray for the service, and we pray to open up and pray for God's blessing upon the service. But this is a time that we come together and we pray as a group, and we pray specific prayers. 
And so I know I rely on Kurt a lot. I'm going to ask him to pray after this song. But realize, realize that our prayers in unity are strong. When they talk in Acts, they said they were in one mind and one accord. It's because everybody was doing what was right and, 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 and coming together and being united. And so specific prayers from people who actually came through here uh, yesterday. So song we picked out is near God to thee. And, you know, I, I always think what it is that, that prayer does for me, and it actually brings me back to my base to say, God, I'm going to move from here. Doesn't mean I've been right today, doesn't mean I was right yesterday, but today I'm coming and I'm praying to you on my knees to say I'm moving from here. So this congregation, let's come together on our knees and our minds and pray after we sing, Nearer, my God to thee. Nearer, my God to thee. Father, Lord, just thank you again for um, just allowing us to be in here today. And as uh, we re reiterate what all my, uh, Micah said there, that, Lord, uh, everybody faces something. Those inside this church, those outside, friends and family, Lord, in general, we could just go on and on and on. And you know everything. You know all that's uh, needed and the healings that needed and the, and, and, and that. But. We also see the praises of yesterday and be able to see people come together and, and uh, Lord, pull together and, and, and work and, and have fun and be in fellowship at the same time, uh, helping uh, raise money for uh, missions that uh, will go well beyond uh, what uh, happened yesterday and, uh, and the good it will do. And we appreciate those, those efforts, Lord. And uh, just continue to look over the... <laughs> Uh, the world in general, and uh, I always will reiterate all those uh, hands and feet that are out there, those are being oppressed, those that that just think differently, that we pray that one day all those uh, minds will be 
uh, humbled and uh, softened that they will come to you lord and know the truth lord and uh, and that we'll be here to start doing our little part of being the hands and feet lord and we just thank you for that and just just continue to look over us as we uh, hear the word and the message and the songs and lord and let's just be uplifted and joyful and and at peace to know that lord you you got us and uh, that's always a joy and when the darkest of times you always go to you in good or bad or indifferent and we uh, uh we can't thank you enough and thank you for your son that he's what he's done for us and uh, for the hope of everlasting life we just thank you in jesus name amen <coughs> You know, it, it's it's crazy, but it can be on top mountain and, and in a valley so quick. You just it's just unbelievable how things change in life sometimes, and <clears throat> whether it's self induced or something happens, it is it focus on our Christian walk and our life. It is vital to how we live out our faith life. Like me, I'm sure a lot of you. There are side issues or distractions that continually compete for our attention. Even Paul in Colossians 3, 2 reminds us on what we must, what's most important in living out our faith life by saying, set your minds on things above, not on things of this earth. Paul himself, uncertain on his way to Jerusalem as to what might happen to him in Acts 20, 24, said, However I consider my life worthy, nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and compete, complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul could have been distracted by many side issues. People often try to pull uh, him and his followers uh, into what he Himself called foolish and stupid arguments in 2 Timothy 2.23. I looked that up to make for sure because whenever I heard those words, I thought, oh, surely that's not in the Bible. It's there. 2 Timothy 2.23. But instead, Paul focused intently on the task to which God called him. That was to share the gospel message of God's grace in salvation. And after hearing what took place, like Carla said, we've got to do more of this. Imagine if everyone in the Christian churches, from us here to every city that has a Christian church, had some kind of that type of focus of what Paul had. We are told daily that we must take up our cross and keep our hearts focused on Jesus. But so many times we're pulled away. This time we come around communion. <coughs> Each week we come here, and it is a time to focus on what has been freely given to us in salvation, redemption, and forgiveness. Because there is nothing good in us. There is none righteous, no, not one. Always making clear that we have, have done nothing to deserve salvation, but because God has given us a plan of salvation, and we have heard, we've believed, and we've confessed, and we've went through the baptism of the holy baptism within, inside the, the water, watery grave. And live a life towards righteousness. It doesn't stop there. It's about us living then from that point out, seeking righteousness. If we have done that, then we come to this time of the table. We focus. We focus in on Jesus. We reset our thoughts for the week. We praise him. We remember him. We thank him. We worship him. So this morning, I pray for you to focus in and come before this table. Your cup's in front of you there with inside your seat. The loaf representing the body that was broken and the juice representing the blood that was freely shed for you and I that we have salvation. I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing, Oh, the blood, the precious blood.
Jesus, we pray to you right now. Oh, God, thank you so much. Forgive us, forgive us, Lord. Help us to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We remember you now. In your name we pray. Amen. Maybe.
Good morning, everyone. I have read over the last couple of months two really good books on the subject of grace. That's where the message for this morning comes from. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want to or would like for you to turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, around verse 9 and 10. But let me ask you a question before I begin this morning. Have you ever thought when you read your Bible, particularly the Old Testament and the Old Testament laws, have you ever thought and asked yourself the question, what did God have against pork? <laughs> or lobster for that matter. I love seafood and I love barbecue. But you know, if you read the book of Leviticus in particular, there are a list of things that the Israelites can eat and a list that they can't eat. So that mindset, if you will, or that background, if you will, is part of our story, our background, rather, to our story. That's why, go ahead with the title of the message if you've got it up. Oh, I sent it to two different emails yesterday. Oh, well. The title of the message is simply, No Oddballs Allowed. And I'll explain it as we go on. Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision. You're probably familiar with the story. It says about noon the following day as they were on their journey, Peter went up to the rooftop to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. While the meal was being prepared downstairs, it says he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open <clears throat> and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time, saying, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened three times, verse 16 says, and immediately the sheet was taken up, taken away. This instance may expand, may, or <clears throat> this instance in Acts chapter 10 may have expanded the so-called diet of the early church, but it still doesn't necessarily answer my question, what did God have against pork. For that, I have to turn to the Old Testament and the book of Leviticus, I believe I've got that one up, where God says in Leviticus chapter 11, I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am holy, because I am holy. There were certain things they could eat and certain things they couldn't eat. And now Bible scholars have pointed out the healthy benefits to the so-called diet of the Israelites. But yet, not all animals can be explained away. It might give a <clears throat> The health benefits might give a little logic to what God had intended, but still there were certain animals that were on the list that really weren't bad. One of those is rabbits. I don't know if you've ever eaten game, but it's pretty good. <laughs> But after thinking about this for a while, I came up with this all-encompassing principle, if you will. And that's the title of the message, No Oddballs Allowed. Meaning, the Israelites' diet excluded any abnormal or oddball, quote-unquote, animals. And if you remember your Old Testament history, the same principle applied to the clean animals. You cannot offer a lamb that has a spot or blemish, that has a defect for a sacrifice. <clears throat> now the Old Testament applied, unfortunately, the same kind of character or lists, characterizations to people. 
Go to the slide about the temple. You remember the construction of the temple. Now let's take the construction of the temple and apply it to this church, okay? Outside there in the foyer and the parking lot would be the court of the Gentiles. And inside here, for us good Jews, would be the inner court. And this area that I'm standing upon would be the Holy of Holies. And a big, tall veil separated the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, from the court of the Jews. No pious person, no matter how pious, maybe I should say, would dare come up to this place for fear of certain death. So see, such a, the way that the animals were separated, got, the people were separated as well. And it reminded the Israelites that God was holy. God was to be set apart. Consider, if you will, a modern-day parallel. Let's say we have a young girl named Patricia, and she decides one day to write a letter to the President of the United States. And she does that just as probably countless boys and girls have done throughout the generations or, or the centuries. And Patricia gets a little bit older, let's say she's teenage years, and her family decides to go visit Washington, D.C. And they go and tour the monuments, and they even go to tour the, the White House. Do you think that Patricia would be able to see the president? Probably not. Because government, our government, runs on a principle of hierarchy that protects those that are the high up, you might say. And that same principle applied to the Old Testament, where certain things were <clears throat> separate as well. Separated people from their God. The, the Old Testament one was not based on prestige, like being the president, but rather cleanliness and uncleanliness. Now, it's one thing to label animals unclean, but it's something completely different to label people. However, the Israelites, or the Jews maybe I should say, did not shrink from that. Leviticus chapter 21, God says, No man, this is verse 18, No man who has any defect may come near, nor who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed, no man with a crippled foot or a hand, or one who is hunchback or dwarf, or who has an eye defect, or who has a festering or running sore, can come to God. In other words, those with damaged bodies, or damaged family members, for that matter, did not qualify. In other words, no oddballs allowed. Now, in this age that we live in of political correctness, or maybe I should say past decade, such a blatant ranking of individuals based on race, gender, or bodily health just seems odd. Actually, that's not the good word. Inconceivable is the word I've gotten written down. However, though, this is what defined first century Judaism. <clears throat> One preacher that I, I think it was Brother Matt, one preacher, Brother Matt, pointed out that every good Jewish man in the first century, when he woke up and said his daily prayers, he thanked God for three things in, in particular. He thanked God he wasn't born a Gentile. He thanked God he wasn't born a slave. And he thanked God he wasn't born a woman. Sorry, ladies. That's just the way it was in, in the first century. And then in Acts, again, going back to our story in Acts chapter 10, Peter's response to God's vision backs up this attitude that the Jews had. When he saw these animals that he thought were unclean, he probably heard his, his wife's, I'm sorry, he probably heard his mom's voice in the back of his head. They said, Peter, don't, don't, don't touch that. That's, you know, nasty, you know, like your mom might have done when you did other nasty things. <laughs> but you can see it in verse 28 of our text, 
when he finally reluctantly goes to Cornelius' house, he says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile. But then Peter says, God has shown me that I should not call a man, <clears throat> any man, impure or unclean. A revelation of grace, if you will, was taking place in Peter's heart and Peter's mind, even though he probably couldn't comprehend it at the time. Now, those of us that have studied our Bible, particularly in the, for first century Palestine, and when Jesus appeared on the scene, have you ever, there was a certain amount of order, rule and order, to Judaism. Again, the ranking of individuals is completely opposite of what I think and probably what you think as well. But at least, to their credit, the Jews did find a place for such groups as women, aliens, slaves, and the poor, because other societies, particularly in the 21st century, treat such groups even worse today. And when Jesus appeared on the scene, Palestine was encountering a revival, if you will. So the Pharisees, being good religious leaders, I'm using that word tongue-in-cheek there, they decided to come up with some more rules to make you more holy. Never eat with a Gentile. Don't dine with a sinner. Don't do any work on the Sabbath. And wash your hands at least seven times before you eat. So when rumors began to spread that perhaps this Jesus was the promised Messiah, if you were a good, devout Jew, you were probably, if anything, appalled rather than being excited because hadn't this individual touched unclean people? He healed a man of leprosy. He allowed a woman, if you remember, of ill repute, to wash his feet with her hair. And <clears throat> he literally, or he dined with tax collectors. He even made one of them part of his inner circle, if you will. He deliberately, Jesus deliberately went into Gentile territory. He liberally, li <clears throat> let me back up here, put my tongue back inside my mouth. He deliberately dealt with Jews, or uh, the Gentiles rather. If you remember your Bible, he praised a Roman centurion because he had more faith than all of Israel. He healed a half-breed or bred Samaritan of leprosy. And he had a lengthy conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. To the dismay of his disciples, if you remember, John chapter 4, because they knew no good Jew associates with those Samaritans. And yet this woman, remember this woman, she had at least two strikes against her. One because of her race, she was a Samaritan, the second one because of her multiple marriages. And yet this woman becomes the first missionary, if you will, going back to her hometown and telling them about all the things that he has said and done. Can this man be the Messiah, she says. And also this woman was the first one whom Jesus revealed, I who speak to you am he. He revealed his messiahship to this woman. And then toward the end of Jesus' ministry, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he commissions the disciples to go to those nasty uh, Gentiles. Remember how he says it, go into all of Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. My friends, I want to suggest to you that Jesus' approach to the unclean people dismayed, first of all, his fellow Jews, and in the end, he, or it got him crucified. Because he took this principle of no oddballs allowed and replaced it with a new rule of grace. We're all oddballs. 
but God loves us anyway or anyhow. I wish I had some money. I would make a bumper sticker out of that <laughs> because that's a good bumper sticker. The Gospels record, if you remember again, remember your scripture, the Gospel records only one instance that Jesus lost his, got mad and lost his temper. Do you remember? It was when he brandished a whip, he made a whip, and he overturned the tables and the benches, driving out the merchants that were gathered where? They were gathered in the court of the Gentiles outside. Remember, Jesus resented <clears throat> that the merchants had turned that area into what we would call today an Oriental Bazaar a place where animals were crying and merchants were haggling over price, hardly an atmosphere for worship. Hardly an atmosphere for worship. And the Gospel of Mark records after this cleansing that the chief priests and the teachers of the law began looking for a way to kill him. Listen, in a sense, Jesus sealed his fate with his angry insistence on the Gentiles' right to approach God. Think about it. <clears throat> In the Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 6, Isaiah prophesies about a great banquet table for all the nations. You see the word peoples there. That means all nations, all peoples, all different ethnic groups, Jew and Gentile, black and white, and so on. And from the time of this prophecy up until the time of Jesus, this grand prophecy got kind of downsized. It got kind of shrunk to where it just in included the Jews. And again, only Jews that were not physically defected. Now you remember also, going back to the Old Testament, or excuse me, going back to the New Testament. When Jesus talks about a banquet, he talks about the host sending out messengers into the streets and the alleys, inviting the poor and the cripple and the lame <clears throat> and the blind. Jesus' most famous story, if you will, Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son also ends in a banquet. And it features as its hero a good-for-nothing. You add your word perhaps there, but that's my word. Because this young man had squandered his inheritance and he shamed his family's reputation. But Jesus' point in that story, perhaps all three stories that are in Luke 15, is this. <clears throat> that those who are judged undesirable by everyone else are infinitely more desirable to God. Let me repeat that. Those who are judged undesirable by everyone else, homeless people, people with AIDS, people that have had COVID, are infinitely more desirable to God. And when one of them comes to God, a party breaks out. We have a celebration because they have come to God. <clears throat> Again, think about Jesus' life, his ministry. When, when he was making social contacts with people, he overturned the categories that the Jews had for clean and unclean. Luke chapter 8, if you want to go, turn to that, please. Luke chapter 8, beginning verse, let's see what verse it is. Verse 26. Luke chapter 8 is probably the best example of this because there are three occasions, three different people that Jesus comes in contact with. And first of all, or rather, once the Pharisees got hold, got wind of his contacts, this must have definitely also sealed his fate with them. First of all, he, sends, he sails into the region that is populated by Gentiles. He heals a naked madman and indeed makes him a missionary. Go back into your town, your hometown, and tell them what, what I have done. 26 through 32. Next, we see Jesus 
touched by a woman with a 12-year hemorrhage. And this condition that she had disqualified her from worship and probably brought her a lot of shame. And yet she is made whole. And from there, Jesus goes to, the, to a synagogue ruler's house and heals his daughter who had just died. He was already considered unclean because of the woman and because of the madman. Now, Levitical law, for all of its bad points, I guess you'd say, does have some good points in the sense that it helped protect people from contagions. You know, don't touch a dead body, don't <clears throat> touch a dead animal, and so on. And Jesus did not cancel this. Oh, wait, back up. <clears throat> Jesus reversed the process. Jesus reversed this process of don't touch something because it's unclean, and then you'll become unclean. He reversed the process in the sense of that individual that was unclean has been made whole. And I have, I, I have not, you know, suffered anything because of that. Rather than becoming contaminated, he made the other person whole. The naked man-man did not pollute Jesus. He got healed. The poor woman with the issue of blood did not shame Jesus and make him unclean. She was healed and went away whole. And the 12-year-old dead girl did not contaminate Jesus. She was resurrected. I sense in Jesus' ministry a, a fulfillment, not an ending, to the Old Testament law. If you remember uh, the Sermon on the Mount, I have come not to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it. In creation, God hallowed creation. He made certain things holy, and he made certain things, of course, to be considered unclean. And Jesus did not cancel this principle, but rather he changed its source. Listen, my friends, we as Christians, we now are agents of God's holiness because God dwells within each and every one of us. And I want to come back to that in a minute. What's the next slide? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, the one I can't hardly read. <laughs> go back just to, or no, go ahead and leave it on that. That's fine. Now, this idea of us being agents of God's holiness, it took the church a while to grasp it. Because if it did grasp it, then Peter would never have had to have had the vision that he did have. Oh no, Lord, I've never handled that unclean stuff, those unclean animals. God says, don't call anything unclean that I have called clean. <clears throat> um, and in that, in the book of Acts, if you remember, the Holy Spirit was not... Uh, he didn't mind, I'll put it that way, prodding the church, encouraging the church on. If you remember Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit takes Philip and sends him where? Do you remember? He sends him to, of all, of all places, Samaria. People avoided Samaria, remember, because those were the half-breed Samaritans. So he sends this good Jew to Samaria puts him on a desert road where he encounters, of all people, a foreigner, a black man, and also a man who was disqualified from worship. You can read the story again in Acts chapter 8. And Peter talking, Peter, <clears throat> Philip talking to the eunuch doesn't make Philip unclean. No, a few hours after that, Philip is baptizing the first missionary to Africa the Holy Spirit prodding the church. And think of the readings of the Apostle Paul, one I have up here on the screen, who called himself, I believe it's in the book of Philippians, a, Phil a Pharisee of all Pharisees. He was probably one of those good Jews who woke up every morning and thank God he wasn't a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. 
But when God got a hold of him, he wrote those revolutionary words. Go back to that, please. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one in Christ Jesus. We are agents of God's holiness. We are agents of God's grace and mercy. This shift, this revolutionary shift of grace that Jesus introduced in his ministry, I think has important consequences <clears throat> for all of us today. And it affects me and it affects you in at least two ways. The first one I want to share. Remember again, the separation of the temple, okay? And let's just say we do it as a, as a church play, okay? Some of you will be Gentiles, so we'll throw you out to the parking lot. Some of you will be good Jews and you can stay here. And two or three of you can be high priests just gathered up here, okay? Picture it as a, as a church play. In the middle of that, a woman comes bursting through those doors, disagreeing, or not, that's not the word, <clears throat> not uh, paying any attention to rules that were set up for her gender. Because if you remember the slide, there was a courtroom or a court for women. So she comes bursting through the sanctuary, carrying of all things a Bible. And she says to the, to the <clears throat> what's the expression, to the top of her voice, she says, any one of us can talk to God directly. Remember, this is an Old, Te an Old Testament temple. <clears throat> and she says, listen to this. And she turns to Hebrews chapter 4 that says, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we pr profess. And then verse 16, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And then she says, here it is again. And she turns to chapter 10 of Hebrews. that says, Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is His body, and since we have such a great high priest over the household of God or house of God, let us draw near to God with full assurance of faith. I appreciate the, the song for communion this morning because that song talked about that blood, the blood that was shed <clears throat> on our behalf. So after she reads those scriptures, she leaves the sanctuary shouting again, all of us can approach God directly. We can talk to God directly. My friends, you only need to read the book of Leviticus and the book of Acts to notice this seismic shift, this seismic change. Because the Old Testament wor worshipers, if you remember, they purified themselves with, from a basin before they presented their offering to a priest or through a priest. Please pray for my family as you offer this sacrifice. Please pray for such and such as you offer this sacrifice. The priest stood right out here before they, uh, forget the literal, they threw the lamb into the fire. <clears throat> but now... God's people, God's followers are meeting in homes, in houses, private houses. And they're addressing God with the informal word, Abba, which literally means daddy. Romans chapter 8, and I forget the verse exactly, but it is referred to there. <clears throat> when, when Paul is talking about our inheritance, how we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ, he mentions that we can call God Daddy. Now before Jesus, no one would even think of 
or be able to comprehend calling the sovereign Lord of the universe Daddy. But now after Jesus, that is the word that is used when praying to God, their Father. <clears throat> Next picture there. Some of you may remember this picture. You may have seen it when it was first broadcast, perhaps on TV. It's a picture of John John, as he was called, John F. Kennedy Jr., in the Oval Office with his dad, President Kennedy. And President Kennedy at that time, no doubt, was talking about the difficulties going on during the early 60s, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, among other things. But John John was completely oblivious to that because all he wanted was to be with his dad. All he wanted was to spend time with his father. My friends, that picture is the kind of shocking accessibility, the kind of shocking accessibility that is expressed in Christ's word, Abba. Yes, God is the sovereign Lord of the universe. Amen? Amen. But through His Son Jesus and the sacrifice and the blood that was shed that we talked about earlier, God made him, Himself <clears throat> as approachable as every loving human father. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul adds to this imagery of intimacy, he reminds us that God's Spirit lives inside each and every one of us. And he says that when we don't know what we ought to pray, <clears throat> the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. My friends, when we think about talking to God, we don't need to think about any ladder of hierarchy and think about whether we have to be concerned about issues of cleanliness. Because let's face it, if the kingdom of God, if heaven had a sign posted out front that said no oddballs allowed, none of us could get through. But Jesus came. Jesus came to demonstrate that a perfect and holy God welcomes pleas of help from a widow with just two mites, from a Roman centurion, from a despicable publican, and a thief on a cross. We only need the call out, Abba, because God has come that close. So in conclusion, is it, can we back up to the last slide? Or find we are all we are all oddballs. Is what I'm trying to say. Remember, we ourselves can be agents of God's holiness, because God lives within each and every one of us. Amid this unclean world that we stride in, and, and Jesus stride, strove in one too. We can be as Jesus a source of holiness. Those sick and maimed are not agents, hot spots to be avoided, but rather vessels to receive His mercy, to receive His grace. As I bring it to a close, in this, again, crazy world that we live in, when things like political division or things like racism mock our nation's ideals and morals and values, when ethnic wars are taking place all around the globe, my friends, I cannot think of no greater message than this. We're all oddballs. But God loves us anyway. And it was that message that eventually got Jesus killed 
but perhaps it will help us win someone to Christ. As the worship teams come up, let me remind you of one other thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, about verse 17, says that we have been given a ministry of reconciliation. God has already made the reconciliation possible by the sacrifice of Jesus, but we now are agents of His holiness, and we go to people like <clears throat> the people that... I forget the one lady was talking about, you know, you were talking about the um, gar garage sale, yard sale. Some people think that they're not worthy to come to church. They've done so many things wrong that they can't come to church. God would never receive them or forgive them. But we say, God's not mad at you. God has made the way. He has torn down the wall of separation. The wall of separation that separates you from him and even you from your fellow brothers and sisters. Come back to God is our message. Receive the grace and mercy that can only come from him. If you need to receive that grace this morning, then you come as we stand and sing. Take my life and let it people who thought that they were not good enough and they have to get good to be here and that it, and we talked about that this morning in Sunday school it's just amazing it obviously it has a little bit of a theme going here so it, it be prepared to help those folks uh not and and by, by telling them that you are a sinner you know and and we're here through only his grace so um that that would be a real shame not for somebody not to go to heaven just because they felt like you know I can't be forgiven. I mean, there's lots of reasons why I may not make it, but that's surely a bad, sad one if we, if we have the opportunity to help them not, uh, not feel that way.
And believe me, that has nothing to do with age. And the, the older they get, the older we get, the harder it is to to break that wall. So please be aware and please help them out. And Lord, help us. Lord, as we go to prayer, Lord, you know you got to give us that wisdom and the discernment and then the courage. And we just ask for that that we will not back away from the opportunity to have someone else have everlasting life with you. And it was, we, we have the, the, the people we prayed with yesterday out in the parking lot and the people that gave us requests. And we, it was just a real nice situation to have people who are now thinking, Lord, please have other people touch them now. Give them more to soften them. Get them somewhere, wherever it is, that they could have you as part of their relationship. And they have the opportunity for everlasting life. And we just thank you again for those opportunities. And uh, be with us this week as we venture out in the mission field and we walk through these doors. Do whatever we can to bring someone to you. We thank you so much for your son and his great sacrifice for us. And it's in the name we pray. Amen.